Okay, so the next talk is going to be by Mavet Mugaga. I think that's how you pronounce your surname. <laughs> I'll let you correct that in a moment. That's all right, don't uh, worry. From uh, the Lyle Center, who is going to talk about new methods to assess past oxygen, ocean oxygenation. Um, good afternoon, and thanks, for, thanks very much for this opportunity to speak at this uh, special session on marine biogeochemistry. So I've recently moved to the Lyle Centre in Edinburgh after finishing a Nurk Fellowship at the University of Oxford. And so my main research interests focus on the development and also application of proxy methods to study um, ocean oxygen concentrations, seawater oxygen concentrations. I'll show you a couple of methods that I've been working on and some of the applications. Um, but I would also like to acknowledge my co-author and collaborator collaborator Zonni Liu from uh, Syracuse University. So future ocean deoxygenation um, has been identified as one of the big major threats to marine habitats. A study by a German group which was published in Nature uh, earlier this year showed that over the last 50 years uh, average global oxygen concentrations in seawater have decreased by 2%. This maybe doesn't sound like a lot, uh, but if it was in our environment, in the atmosphere, we would be gasping for breath right now. In the oceans, oxygen is more uh, kind of varied, but those areas where oxygen is already a little bit limiting, they are going to be majorly affected uh, by these changes. So one area, oxygen levels are severely um, low, uh, represent oxygen minimum zones or ocean dead zones because they don't really support aerobic life. Um, and it's been shown that these have been um, expanding. And one of the worries is that with this expansion, there's going to be more um, episodes of harmful algal blooms and things like that, which will have uh, you know, detrimental impacts on local environments, fisheries, and tourism. Now, for the future, Earth system models predict that oxygen concentrations are going to decrease even further, maybe even by 30% by the year 2800. However, you need to realize that there's a lot of model uncertainties. There is disagreements between models, especially around equatorial regions. And um, if you kind of look at this model from uh, CMIT 5, carried out by Bob et al., um, you can see how what the predicted changes in global ocean oxygen concentrations are with time on the different kind of CO2 forcings. So the blue one gives you the lowest forcing, but in the year 2100, you end up with CO2 of just over 400. And the red one is the largest one, you end up with CO2 of 900. Um, and so with increased CO2 forcing and warming, it's predicted that dissolved oxygen concentrations are going to decrease even more. Now, what is interesting is that the 2% decrease um, that has been kind of described earlier this year, this is actually not uh, even in the models. It's models grossly underestimate uh, what's happening in the oceans today, basically. Um, one particularly um, issue could also be because there's a quite a big lack of knowledge in oxygen. Uh, we could, we've only been doing measurements for the last, say, 50 years, so our knowledge of the nat natural oxygen cycle is quite limited by that. And so proxy time series of oxygen reconstructions will be really useful to kind of understand the longer term natural oxygen cycle. And perhaps these insights into the past will actually help improve future predictions by um, calibrating models. So there's already quite a lot of really exciting and nice proxy methods out there. One is lamination, preservation, and sediments. So this is um, along the west coast of America. And in black circles, you have um, core sites where lamination is preserved today. And you can see that this happens typically when oxygen concentrations are below 5 micromoles per kilogram. Other proxies include the accumulation of trace, redox-sensitive trace metals and sediments, uh, bulk nitrogen isotope measurements as a, a kind of proxy for the intensity of denitrification, 
and also uh, for municipal communities, uh, assemblages have been used to kind of uh, look at changes in oxygen concentrations. But what is clear is that although the seawater oxygen range is about 300 micromoles per kilogram, all these <coughs> proxies kind of are targeted, to, uh, targeted towards the lower oxygen range from, range from about hypoxic to suboxic. And so we have a major gap uh, towards the higher oxygen range. And also for like sur surface waters, we don't really have much. Uh, so one of the proxies I've been working on is this benthic formula for carbon isotope gradient proxy. So this uh, proxy kind of uh, is based on this kind of uh, <coughs> relationship that you can see between the carbon isotope gradient between bottom water and pore water at the anoxic boundary in sediments and the overlying bottom water oxygen concentration. And this gradient is also replicated in benthic formula that have specific habitats in bottom water and at this anoxic boundary. Uh, so we can use this method to reconstruct oxygen concentrations uh, on the conditions where oxygen varies between 55 and 235 micromoles per kilogram, uh, with an error of about 17 micromoles per kilogram. At high oxygen concentrations, it doesn't work. And I'm quite happy to discuss that a little bit further at the end if anybody is interested. Um, so application of this proxy on a color just of Portugal in the Iberian margin um, shows that, so time goes from recent, <coughs> go back in time, here you have the last glacial maximum, and here you have the penultimate glacial. Um, and it shows that during glacial times, oxygen concentrations at this particular site were about a fifth uh, from what they were today. And in addition, during intervals when we had like these large ice armadas uh, melting in the North Atlantic, indicated by these H's, um, oxygen concentrations at this site were also greatly reduced. Now, causes for this um, are a combination of changes in... Sorry. Causes of this are related to changes in water masses, uh, ventilation, and also kind of export production and remineralization of organic material. Now, the second proxy method is iodine calcium in planktonic foraminifera as a subsurface uh, oxygen proxy. So, iodine occurs in two species. Um, its oxidized form is iodate, and its reduced form is iodine. In normal open ocean settings, um, iodate is the main species. Obviously, as you can see in this Weddell Sea profile in blue. But then, when you get into areas where you have oxygen minimum zones, like the Eastern Equatorial Pacific and the Arabian Sea, then the iodate uh, completely disappears and basically has been reduced to iodide. This reduction, uh, we think, believes uh, occurs around the hypoxic, suboxic range. This is something that we need to find out more about uh, to kind of be able to more narrowly constrain this. Now, iodate is the only form of iodine that's actually taken up into form an calcite. And so in forums, we can, it's very useful then um, to reconstruct um, whether iodide or iodine was the main kind of redox uh, species that was in the surface waters. So in the, on the right side here are planktonic from uh, recent ones uh, where we've got quite high oxygen concentrations and high iodine calcium ratios. So these are in the North Atlantic in the solid ocean. And then towards the left, um, indicated by 1242, and 720 are samples um, from the eastern equatorial Pacific and the Arabian Sea, where we have these really low values that correspond to like low iodide in the waters as well. Application of this on a core in the southern Asia ocean came up with some really interesting results. So this core here today is in really well oxygenated waters, and we find also quite high iodine calcium ratios in these planktonic formulifera um, during interglacials. And then when we go to the glacials, we see much lower. So you've got the LGM here, and then we to the glacial there. And we think that suggests that subsurface waters there were of much lower oxygen concentrations than they are today. So that's a stark contrast. And now, so to kind of summarize, so the, the kind of these new proxy methods kind of are, um, 
uh, adding kind of more knowledge to the oxygen cycle than we had before. So we've been able, if we're in the right conditions, we can use these magnetic quantum carbonized of radiant to get quantitatively reconstruct oxygen concentrations on this much wider range. And planktonic quantum ion calcium ratios are also very useful to identify whether those hypoxic subsurface waters. And what's really interesting or cool about this proxy as well is that for like laminations, nitrogen isotopes, benthic sandwiches, you all have to get cores from here. For the iron calcium, you can have anywhere you know where the subsurface actually has kind of low oxygen waters. Uh, at the end of the life cycles, these planktonic formnifera will fall to the uh, bottom of the ocean, and then we can take them out again with cores and take them out, analyze them, and find out what was happening in the surface ocean, basically. So just to wrap up some concluding remarks, so we need more data sets of dissolved oxygen concentration, and this is critical for understanding the natural oxygen cycle. This development of these two proxies is, you know, an exciting way to kind of look at different way of changes in oxygen oxygenation, um, covering some gaps that we previously had. And these results are really important also to improve our knowledge about the cycling of carbon and oxygen and nitrogen. And then finally, we'll be advertising for a PhD position soon in marine geoscience and climate change at the Loyal Center, uh, working on this kind of stuff. So if you know anybody or yourself interested, then get in touch, please. That's it. <laughs>
things that you have to look out for basically when you are doing these reconstructions. Okay. Time for one more. Yep. Thank you very much. <laughs>